Jewish Federation of Orange County and the Rayuth Group. We are delighted to partner today with the Jewish Council for Public Affairs and to welcome so many viewers from communities around the country. I'm Lisa Armoni, and I'm the director of the Rose Project of Jewish Federation of Orange County. For more than 50 years, Jewish Federation has been strengthening Jewish life in our local community in Israel and around the world through philanthropy, by providing inspiring Jewish programming and engagement, as well as critical social services. Through the Rose Project, we provide a local platform for Israel education, engagement, and advocacy, as well as thought leadership and levels of strategic planning and, and, and community building, which you're going to hear more about shortly. Before I get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you can submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom control panel on your computer. Thank you to the many participants who submitted questions when you registered. And for those of you who'd like to submit your questions during the webinar, we will keep track of them and we will direct as many questions as we can um, to our speakers according to how much time we have available. We'll do our best. We're recording this webinar and we'll be happy to share that recording with you after the event. Um, you'll also find this recording and other recordings of our webinars on our website, www.jewishoc.org. Um, and we're also live streaming on Facebook. As the title of this webinar suggests, we're in a very interesting period experiencing a variety of social and political disruptions that present challenges to existing structures and relationships. But there's also some interesting opportunities for Jewish community to rise as a result. At the same time, the coronavirus global pandemic has challenged Jewish communities to contemplate new ways of thinking, community, engagement, resource allocation, structures, and more as our ways of operating pre-COVID may need to be adapted if communities are going to continue to thrive. It is in this unique inflection point that we come together and unpack through the innovative strategic model of Jewish adaptability, some challenges and opportunities. To get us started, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Margolis, the founding co-chair of the Road Project. Jeff is a renowned innovator and entrepreneur in the healthcare IT sector who has built some of the nation's largest and most innovative healthcare technology and service organizations. Here in Orange County's Jewish community, Jeff has played an instrumental role in community building and development, including and particularly here at the Rose Project, where he's really shaped our ability to engage strategically and to support community planning. And a lot of this is shaped by Reut Group methodology. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn this over to you now, thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, hi everybody, those of you on the West Coast, um, thank you for sharing your lunch with us. And those of you uh, who are having your mid-afternoon coffee, thank you as well. Um, again, I'm Jeff Margolis. I rarely um, come on screen uh, as it relates to the Rose Project uh, of Orange County, but I usually get two questions. Um, what is Orange County and what is the Rose Project? Uh, for those of you um, who are looking for downtown Orange County, you won't find it. But Orange County is about 3.2 million people. If it was a country, it'd be the 45th largest in the world. It's the sixth ranked largest metro area uh, in terms of uh, GDP in the country, bigger than 27 states, if that gives you some idea. But we're kind of a diaspora because we don't have a central place. Um, we're all over the country. The Rose Project, uh, which I've had the pleasure to be with since its founding, was established in 2008 under the banner of Jewish Federation by then CEO Shalom Elkat, who I think was prescient in working to establish it. What the Rose Project does is it fills in the white space of what often does not happen in communities. Back in 2008, Orange County College campuses were the epicenter of Jewish uh, anti-Semitic anti activity on campuses. 
um, anti-Israeli movement, uh, delegitimization, and so forth. And uh, what we did is rather than the typical response of writing nasty letters and um, being righteously indignant and threatening uh, decision makers, we decided to take another tact. We decided to, to create programming and put it into action. And so we established relationships with the administrators at the universities at both the Orange County and at the state level. Uh, we worked directly with the Israeli consulate. We worked with law enforcement. We worked with the different congregations uh, in the area, as well as the local branches of the national groups, such as ADL and AJC and Stand With Us. Um, and we really had three initial goals, to improve Jewish student life on campus, uh, to develop self-sufficient Jewish student leaders, and then to engage the broader Jewish community uh, on complex issues of importance. Uh, the first two of those, we've really handed off to campus organizations such as Hillel, and in Orange County, we've got a very uh, uh, strong uh, Chabad organization as well. Um, and we've really now focused, as Lisa says, on what is going on with complex issues, largely around um, Israel and uh, delegitimization movements and so forth. And since the beginning of the creation of Rose, we have been working very closely with our friends at the Rayu Group. And what I'd like to do uh, is to share a framework of community planning that we use here in Orange County. Uh, I know many of you on the call are from Orange County. Um, and what I will tell you is that this framework is based on uh, interactions and a book uh, written by Giddy Grinstein, uh, who I'll introduce uh, in just a moment. Uh, but basically, Peoplehood, nationhood, and a light unto the nations uh, is a formulation Giddy will talk a little bit more about in terms of Jewish adaptability. And if we'll hit the next slide, please. What we've done is we've said, what are the programming things that we have to do to develop leaders in Orange County and also to work across boundaries in Orange County and you can see we've gathered up these different categories, uh, thought leadership, conflict resolution, what many would call a CRC, an education on anti-Semitism under peoplehood, Israel education and anti-delegitimization activities under nationhood. And we always are conscious that everything we are doing is in the context of Jewish values. How do we think about who to reach in our county? If we can hit the next slide, please. What you see down the left side is the different community constituents that we think about in terms of who we have to get this different kind of programming to in the county. And if we can hit the next slide, please. Um, this essentially creates a, what I would call a planning matrix. Um, we hope you would find this uh, planning matrix useful uh, potentially in things that are going on in your organizations uh, or in your community. And just to finish it out for you, uh, you can probably tell that I'm a business executive who does a lot of planning, but I just wanted to show you a sample on the next slide of how we plug in which organizations in the county uh, are going to work on which issues with which groups. This avoids us um, stepping on one another. It allows for coordination and sharing of programming across different groups. So you can see Hillel, APAC, ADL, uh, the Federation itself at the parent level are things that uh, we coordinate across our county. So I hope that's very useful uh, to you. Um, that the peoplehood, nationhood, and light into the nations uh, comes from this construct of um, what we would call uh, the book Flexibility. And if we could hit the next slide. Um, it's my pleasure at this time to introduce uh, to you um, Giddy Grinstein. Giddy is the founder and president of Rayu Group. He's a longtime um, a colleague of the Rose Project in Orange County. Um, we've watched uh, the amazing progress 
of what it means to put together thought leadership in a think tank um, and to be able to take the best thoughts of people that understand Israel, understand Judaism, understand the history of our people and to put it together in a way that we can apply, as Lisa said, during these very, very interesting times we're in. So with that, Giddy, let me turn this over to you and we'll come back for questions later. Thank you. So Giddy, you might wanna turn on your camera and unmute. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Jeff, very much for this extremely generous um, introduction. And, um, and what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is actually expand on these ideas of flexibility and share with you some of the key concepts that uh, have shaped it, uh, its thinking. I just wanna say that uh, uh, Orange County has always been a community that has been uh, really uh, uh, a place where uh, we at the Road Group, my colleague Iran and I and our team, were able to meet people, open-minded people who were really inclined to experiment with new ideas and to try out new, new approaches. And that's how I think this is the basis of our relationship and the, uh, that we have struck over the years. And it has been a real pleasure to keep going back to your community and to, uh, to meet the people who are doing the work, people like yourselves, uh, lay leaders and professional, uh, and to test out these concepts for you and actually to do this experimentation, not just in the service of the Jewish community in Orange County, but also to use the lessons that we have learned. And Jeff, you know that multiple times in the past, we were looking at what you guys were doing at the Rose Council and in other forums, in other fora, and to actually model these experiences and share it with other communities. So it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you today and with other people that called in from uh, other places. Um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is actually uh, expand a little bit on this idea of flexibility, which is a portmanteau word that brings together two words, flexibility and rigidity. And uh, that word came together in my mind following a journey, a personal journey that I went through that tried to explore basically the secret sauce of Jewish adaptability, which means what is this underlying secret of the remarkable resilience, the recurring prosperity, and the permanent leadership of the Jewish people in humanity. Um, and my conclusion, and I think a lot of you will, you know, will, it will sound close to home, is that our communities represent a mix of innovation and tradition, old and new, flexibilities and rigidities. And that interaction between those dynamics, the dynamic of the old, of the tradition, of the rigidity, and the dynamics of flexibility, of new, of innovation, the interaction between those uh, forces is what optimizes the pace of adaptation of our community. So our community actually evolves through the interaction of multiple players and multiple communities all the time. Some of them are innovative, some of them are bringing new ideas, but since not every new idea is a good idea, there's also those who are pulling the brakes on progress, who are actually asking hard questions, who are resistant to change. And that interaction is the, and the way we, it happens, it unfolds in, in across the entire Jewish world is the secret sauce of Jewish adaptability. And uh, I've found this kind of magical mix uh, between flexibilities and rigidities in multiple areas of Jewish societies. And today I think we should focus on two. The first is what I call flexibility of mission. It relates to how we understand the mission, the founding myth, the founding stories of the Jewish people. And as Jeff said, I've seen four stories here. The first founding story, you know, not by order of importance because they're always there, all four of them, is the story of peoplehood. It means that we are a group of people that has a shared legacy and a shared destiny. We are bound together by very strong forces of mutual responsibility. And these forces transcend religious gaps, political uh, differences in political views, 
in economic approaches, you could be a, comp a communist or a capitalist. You could be a Zionist or an anti-Zionist. Still, everybody is still part of this notion of the Jewish people. The second idea, the second uh, meta story is the story of nationhood. It speaks about us as a people that are connected to a specific place on the face of this earth, which is the state of Israel, the land of Israel. So this is a narrative, this is a story about exile and return, about ownership, sovereignty, and control. It celebrates, it is embodied in the Zionist movement, in all the Zionist organizations around the world. It celebrates Aliyah, immigration to the land of Israel, to the state of Israel, and so on. The third story is that we have a mission to humanity, to be a light unto the nations. This story actually celebrates the, the, the commitment of the Jewish people to offer a qualitative contribution to humanity and to do it at all times. What is special about this story is that for millennia, our contribution to humanity was based on our values and institutions and structures and the laws of our society. But in recent years, and I'm talking just in the last 20, 30 years, so it's a blink of an eye historically, we can actually also improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people. This is the first time in our history that we can actually improve lives on a quantitative basis. And that happens because of the unique combination of the state of Israel and the innovation and the amazing innovation that comes out of it with the worldwide web of Jewish communities around the world, the commitment to tikkun olam, and the power of technology. And the fourth story is that we are a religious group. Together and separately, we're bound in a special relationship with God. Uh, this actually translates into multiple uh, mitzvot and commandments. And all together, these four stories are ever present in the psyche of every community, in the psyche of many, many Jews. And they're always interacting to define our way, our way uh, forward. So whenever we ask, is we know whenever something big happens and we ask is it good for the jews there is the people who would answer there is the nation who would answer which basically means is it good for israel there is a light uh, the, the light unto the nation's answer and there's obviously the religious answer is the event good or not good for the jews so that's sort of a, a brief introduction to this idea of flexibility of mission and now i'd like to focus on what i call the flexibility of structure the basic idea here is that every Jewish community, including yours in Orange County, has a core set of institutions that is identical to all other Jewish communities around the world. All Jewish communities have a school, they have community centers, they have a rabbi, they have a shochet, they have a mohel, they have key functions that will exist everywhere that are essential for running Jewish life. But no two Jewish communities are identical. Jewish communities can be very, very different. And their difference responds to the geography that they're in, to the demography, to the country, to the politics, to the historical context. So basically, again, every Jewish community shares the same core institutions. No two Jewish communities are alike. And all of these Jewish communities are interconnected by what I call protocol, by these seamless, unseen connections that actually make uh, the distance, if you wish, between Orange County and a Jewish community in South Africa or in Australia or in Hong Kong or in Europe, much closer, is much easier for a member of the Jewish community uh, where you are to, to get to South Africa than to someone who is not part of the Jewish community. So that worldwide web of Jewish community is uh, basically the architecture of the Jewish people, and that too is flexigit. Now, what's very, very interesting about this whole structure is that, as you know, the Jewish people has no pope, no president, no prime minister. We're a flat network of communities. And that's why we progress and we advance through permanent competition between our communities and between the institutions among them. So basically, the Jewish people is a platform for intellectual, and inter entrepreneurial meritocracy, which means you can lead in the Jewish people even if you're not the biggest community, even if you're a smaller community. And this is where I think that uh, some of the work 
that has been done in Orange County has been echoing far beyond Orange County, and I'm sure we'll speak about that uh, a little bit later. So we evolve through the internal evolution. So the Jewish people evolves through the internal evolution of these institutions and the interaction among them. Now, as we all know, the history of the Jewish people, we have responded to big changes in history and technology. Um, and the winning response did not always come, as I said, from the leading community. I can give multiple examples for that. We don't have the time, but I just wanna say something that probably we'll all, we will all agree on this call, that COVID-19 represents a challenge of adaptation, maybe the biggest challenge of adaptation of the recent uh, decades, perhaps since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it requires all the Jewish world to go through what we at the Reut Institute called a grand pivot. So a grand pivot is basically happens through the multiple small pivots of communities, which takes place through the multiple smaller pivots of the institutions. So the grand pivot of the Jewish people is the sum total in, in response to COVID-19 is the sum total of the smaller pivots of our communities and institutions. And this is where I think there is a big uh, opportunity for a community like yours. If you have a strong sense of what is the right thing to do, and if you have the ability to do it, and if you go ahead and do it, you may be the ones who will offer a way and maybe also the way for American uh, jury. So with that, I wanna actually um, close and, and, uh, uh, and my colleague around would actually get into the details of what we mean when we say the grand pivot in response to COVID-19. So uh, Jeff or Lisa, thank you very much for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. So, hello everyone. My name is Aran Shaishon. I'm, I'm uh, as Gidi said, I'm the CEO of the Root Group. And first, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Rose Project, Jeff and Lisa for initiating this event and for the long year partnership between Rose and uh, Root. I join uh, Gidi's warm words uh, we, Rehut and Rose, are going a long way together and I've always considered the, the professionalism and sophistication of, of uh, the Rose projects to be outstanding in the field. And I would also like to thank the JCPA for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, we've been engaged with the JCPA, the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, in the past few years in a joint effort to elevate the entire community relations field in the U.S which we believe is crucial for both the cohesion of the Jewish community and its ability to respond to all sorts of anti-Semitism. Of course, is a, is a very important, uh, uh, has a very important role in the grand pivot of the Jewish people uh, when uh, dealing with Corona. Um, today, I will start by shortly presenting uh, Reut, then discuss the unique challenges and disruptions we are facing, and then pick a couple of mega surprising opportunities to tackle during this uh, turbulent reality. So very quickly about Reut, for those of you who don't know us. Uh, Reut is an Israeli nonprofit impact and strategy organization that helps the state of Israel, the Israeli society, and the Jewish world to tackle their most, some of their most acute challenges. What makes Reut unique are two sets of tools. The first is a research, a research and strategy package, which is based on a methodology and technology that allows us to identify blind spots of Israeli and Jewish leaders uh, and to make sense of things during disruptions, a critical element in the effort uh, to adapt. The second is our impact approach, which we call the ecosystem approach, uh, where it sees itself as a catalyst that strives to mobilize adaptive change in an ecosystem and mobilize a range of government and civil society organizations. What we actually do are, are four things. Uh, first is we provide thought leadership, based on this unique methodology that, that I've mentioned in the form of policy papers, et cetera. Second, we empower key organizations by helping these organizations to re-strategize, reorganize, uh, or restructure. Uh, uh, and we did such a process exactly a year ago in Orange County with the Rose, uh, Rose Project, and also uh, with and for the JCPA in the past couple of, couple of years. Uh, the third thing that we do is that we create networks and coalitions regarding every issue that we tackle. A prominent example uh, is the Israeli Peoplehood Coalition that Reut launched uh, a couple of years ago and leads since. Um, it's composed of hundreds of Israeli social leaders, and maybe I'll come to that uh, later. And the last thing that we do is that we educate 
Israeli Jewish leadership and support decision-making uh, process. So uh, going to the point, few words about the unique time in which we are living. Um, the confluence of the corona pandemic alongside other major disruptions, such as the deep economic recession, the anti-racist struggle in the US, the, the election year in the US, even developments in the balance of power in the Middle East and other events, all during a dramatic leap in the use of technology, are leading humanity into a new era. The public discourse is often focused on the questions, when will a COVID-19 vaccine be ready and could be deployed, as if we are going back to the same reality before Corona when uh, that is uh, done. But we are living a paradigm shift. The world will not be the same. New threats are coming our way, but also new opportunities. Uh, and that's also an opportunity to bring forward new agendas and experiments. COVID-19 and the economic recession that follows have forced Jewish communities to prioritize their programs and most basic needs. These disruptions are fundamentally reshaping Jewish communities in new ways. The new normal will require Jewish communities to reboot the Jewish experience. This is what we call the grand pivot of the Jewish community. It's a huge multi-layered challenge. As such, the full scope of the report for transformation may be a little bit too broad to tackle in the, uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes that, that I have today. So I would like to focus on only a couple of challenges, which are in fact also opportunities. The first is the difficulty of communal organizations to engage with non-mainstream uh, audiences and unaffiliated. The second is the changing map of threats and the rise of anti-Semitism. So let me tackle the first challenge, the difficulty of communal organizations to engage with non-mainstream and unaffiliated and the opportunity to make communities more representative, diversified, and inclusive during this grand people. So the current disruptions present an unparalleled opportunity to tackle one of the main sickness facing the Jewish community. This is the eroding ability of communal organizations to engage and authentically represent their constituencies. In the past few years, Jewish communal organizations are fighting for relevance, and are unable sometimes effectively engage with young Jews or non-mainstream Jews. In some communities, unaffiliated and non-mainstream Jews in fact represent a large majority. And I know that uh, here or there in Orange County, you've been looking into the possibility to do a survey of the unaffiliated. This is not unique to Orange County, of course. Most Jews in the US are not active in communal activities or frameworks. So what is the opportunity in Corona in regards to this challenge? First, the Corona provided federations and community frameworks a proof of concept. Despite the expected meager resources, the value of the communal organizations as a social and economic safety nets rises as more people are in need of more locally based services. And also the blow of the idea of open globalization is also strengthened communal framework and the logic uh, of, uh, of communal framework and under on the expense of universal outlook. Second is the potential to lower the cost of Jewish education. The reality is that many young American Jews do not receive Jewish education. The major flaw of Jewish education is of course the high cost. But now social distancing has been moving communities online and transformed Jewish education and make it much more affordable. So new models of Jewish education created during this crisis can generate a critical turning point uh, in building and affirming Jewish community. Third, we believe that there's also an opportunity to engage with non-mainstream and unaffiliated audiences due to two uh, main uh, reasons. In light of the ongoing anti-racist struggle, increasingly Jewish organizations are seeking to ensure that communi communal frameworks are more diversified and representative. Up until now, Jewish institutions were largely not proportionally racially diverse to the extent that is expected from a Jewish community, which according to some estimates comprises 20% uh, of Jews of color. And this joins a dramatic rise that has developed over the past few years of the Israeli expat community's institutionalization process. The most not notable example is of course the rise of the self-organized Israel American Council, which uh, is probably the fastest growing Jewish organizations, uh, organization worldwide. There are more reasons to that, but these are three factors that could provide the Jewish community an opportunity. 
Again, the proof of concept of federation provided by the corona crisis and the potential to lower the cost of Jewish education and the opportunity to engage with non-mainstream and unaffiliated due to the reorganization process and the reorganization process. So the rise of the unaffiliated and non-mainstream non uh, constituencies whose opinions have not been considered during general polls of American Jewry require also, or may require, rethinking of assumptions regarding the views of American Jews on several issues, including Israel, but maybe we'll discuss this uh, uh, later. The second opportunity that I want to highlight is maybe surprising, is the, the opportunity to turn the table on the rising anti-Semitism in the US, anti-Semitism that comes from both right and left. In light of the, uh, of the corona, Jews all over the world, including, of course, in the US, are reporting a higher level of anti-Semitism. In the US and in Europe, attention has focused on the anti-Semitism coming from black communities. It's a global phenomenon, by the way. It's not uh, only a US issue. It's also very much uh, visible uh, in the UK and in other places. Anti-Israeli groups strive to draw parallels between the police brutality in the US and the Israeli conduct uh, towards the Palestinians. So anti-Semitism now is visible. To many people, it looks like a tsunami. But a closer look shows that actually, the Jewish community is better positioned to tackle it and in a better position to meaningfully engage with black women. There's a window of opportunity open. Why am I saying this? The leader of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, is probably the most dominant figure in this regard. His blatant expressions against Jews are, not, are quoted by many within the black community including recently by celebrities uh, like uh, entertainer Nick Cannon, NFL, the Sean Jackson, and others. The attributes of this classic anti-Semitism are usually associated with the extreme political right. The Farrakhan blend of anti-Semitism comes with a small twist. By side, again, these blatant expressions of racism and violence, it is based on the notion that Jewish power negates black communities' rights, that it chokeholds on black rights. So the rise of classic anti-Semitism is of course a source of, of grave concern to the Jewish community. But at the same time, and this is the good news, it is still broadly acknowledged and condemned within political and social discourse, definitely in the mainstream. For example, most celebrities who quoted Farrakhan, including uh, uh, the one I've mentioned, ended up apologizing following large public condemnation. That shows you something about the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times and the general intolerance within society at large to anti-Semitism. And I know it sounds, uh, it sounds trivial, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Classic anti-Semitism generates a broad Jewish consensus against it. And the reason I'm saying what seems to be the obvious is that it stands in contrast to anti-Semitism that comes from the progressive side of the map. This sort of anti-Semitism from the left of progressive anti-Semitism has failed to garner widespread uh, outrage. It also did not generate a cohesive and united front of Jewish coalition against it. So what is this progressive anti-Semitism? It's, of course, hostility against Jews coming from the progressive left, which is mainly expressed by holding all Jews responsible for the original Z sin of Zionism, exclusion of Jews from identifying as a collective, and third, holding Jews uniquely responsible for oppressive power structure as white privileged group. And of course, demanding as a result that Jews renounce any claim of prejudice, discrimination, or insecurity. But there are some good news. I, talked, I said that there is a, uh, an opportunity here. The centrality of progressive anti-Semitism to the current social protest are diminishing with the rise of the overwhelming focus on the anti-black racism struggle. And here's why. During the Ferguson riots um, six years ago, the anti-racist struggle shaped by within the framework of intersectionality. To be uh, very short, intersectionality is a theoretical framework that turned into organizing logic that drew parallels between the struggles of several oppressed groups and disempowered population. In practice, it, it drove this important population in coalition. So anti-Israel protests, anti-Israeli groups have managed to promote their agenda with the slogan from Ferguson to Palestine as part of the intersectional social uh, uh, circle, which is one of the most remembered themes from Ferguson to Palestine uh, in, this, in this protest. But to our point, 
Intersectionality enabled progressive anti-Semitism to evolve, but the intersectionality framework is losing dominance in the current anti-racist protest. Today, anti-racist struggle is conceptually rooted in what we in Root call black exceptionalism, namely focusing on the claims of blacks based on the uniqueness of the black experience and suffering. And why is this important? Simply put, in the Ferguson riots, intersectionality allowed anti-Israeli groups that stand in solidarity with the black movement to push their agenda, to push their agenda in the anti-racist struggle. But during the current protest, black exceptionalism focused almost exclusively on the suffer of the black, on the suffer, sorry, of the black community and is less susceptible to attempts by different groups to promote their own agenda, including by anti-Israeli groups that promote, for example, boycott on Israel. And indeed, despite many attempts by anti-Israeli groups during the George Floyd protest to draw parallels between American police brutality and Israeli conduct towards the Palestinian, by and large, this effort did not get a notable uh, traction. So the relative decline of progressive anti-Semitism within the current anti-racist struggle may be temporary. I believe it is temporary. But the anti-black anti racism struggle presents a very real opportunity to meaningfully engage with black and anti-racist movements. This is what community relations organizations are doing. This is to some extent, or to, to a large extent, is what the Roach Pro Project are doing. And why is this important? Going back to Corona, to COVID-19 and the grand pivot, due to the economic recession and the shrinking Jewish wallet, there's a need to prioritize investments in the Jewish community. So my message to you is that given the rising importance of identity politics, the community relations field must be prioritized. The Jewish community cannot afford not to invest in it. The ability of the Jewish community to engage in the anti-racist struggle in light of the rise of identity politics can significantly impact Jewish identity in continuity, Israel's relations with world Jewry, and ultimately, and ultimately Israel's relations in the US. To sum up, I'm going to, uh, to end very quickly. The new normal will require Jewish communities a significant adaptation. And I was unable to cover the full scope of this required uh, transformation, so I focused on a couple. An opportunity to deal with the decline of the Jewish communal organizations by generating new relevance of Jewish communal organizations through engagement with non-mainstream and the unaffiliated. And second, it's maybe a surprising opportunity to better deal with the current wave of anti-Semitism. So, what I spoke about today was a taste from our thought leadership capabilities, but as said, we are committed to generate change and to turn such insights into action. The current challenging period requires a bold, courageous, and vision-driven leadership that can seize emerging opportunities. So this is what we're trying to do with leading Jewish community organizations. Here in Orange County, uh, our primary partner is the Rose Project, and nationwide is the JCPA. And this is why I believe that this uh, triple partnership is just uh, suitable for uh, this kind uh, of event. So I'll stop here and maybe we'll open it up for several questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Iran and Giddy um, and Jeff. Um, I'd actually like to ask uh, the first question. I'd like to go back to your uh, the comments that you made, the first challenge around the opportunity for Jewish uh, organizations to be more inclusive, to, to engage more with those who have not been traditionally represented in Jewish community structures. Um, and I'd like to ask, I guess, a little bit of a process question here um, about um, what, what are the sort of internal conversations, the very brave kind of conversations do, do Jewish communities need to start to have in order to be able to um, to be more open, because I think as much as we have um, we've understood the ability um, to reach and and to recognize um, some of the more marginalized voices in our community, uh, I wonder if there's some internal barriers that need to be addressed and overcome before we can be fully inclusive. Yes, I, I would like to refer to maybe two uh, two issues that are relevant to your questions. First is the internal conversation regarding the status of the Jewish community. Many young Jews internalize the concepts that are being produced by progressive groups who are, have very critical views of Israel. Namely, in other words, they perceive the Jewish community as white privilege and therefore not, pa pa 
part of the power structure that actually prevents or promotes the systemic racism. So I believe that engaging with young Jews and, and, and deliberating about, uh, uh, about this issue is, is highly important. Second thing is Israel's relations with world Jewry, which I believe is maybe, maybe the big elephant in the room. We have seen the past few years that there's a gap, gap that is getting uh, bigger and broader between Israel and world Jewry. And clearly, this is the result of, uh, of developments that are happening on both sides of the pond, right? Clearly, American Jewry has, have their own uh, set of challenges, which you are probably more familiar uh, than I. There's, uh, there's a, certainly an identity challenge. Uh, BDS confuses many young people on, on, on campuses. This is a very complex challenges that, that you are facing. You, cannot, you can say many things about this challenge, but you cannot say one important thing about this challenge. It's not a blind spot. Namely, Jewish community organizations, uh, including federations and the Rose Projects, are tuned to this issue. I believe that the problem is the Israeli side, in the sense that in Israel, world Jewry is not on the agenda of Israelis. Zionism, and what I'm going to say, I'm going to say as a proud Zionist. Zionism, with all the good that it brought, brought a very uh, particular outlook in how Israelis view the diaspora of Jewish communities. And I believe that because classical Zionism negated the notion of diaspora, the Israeli educational system, as an example, did not, do not include curriculum on world jury. And the result is generation and generation of Israelis who are completely ignorant about world jury. So unless there will be a receptor to your Israel engagement efforts, we will not see a dramatic change in Israel's relations with war jury, and I believe that this issue is very critical uh, to uh, to the challenge that you are facing. So, so Iran, to that to that point, um, and thank you, and Giddy, if you're still out there, feel free to join. Um, but so here we are. You know, we're sitting in the middle of um, this unprecedented disruption with COVID nineteen that's happening. Uh, it, it, it knows no boundaries in terms of who it's impacting. Um, and then there's a few things going on in the Middle East right now, I think. Um, can, um, if, if we have a couple questions from the audience that are similar, but what, what are the one or two major trends you think um, are impacting uh, the way we think about positioning um, the Jewish people in the Israeli dialogue right now, right this moment. You want to take it, Gidi? I'll go ahead and then. So, so the first one is, is, is very obvious. This is the rise of, of identity politics. I believe that uh, um, when we look on the American demographics, it is very clear that this issue is very much going to dictate the conversation uh, the internal Jewish conversation and Israel's relations uh, um, uh, with the diaspora. And I, I believe that the history of, the, of this future has yet to be written. This is very much dependent on the political efficacy and the prospects of engagement of the Jewish community. The current uh, rise of identity politics is framed versus white privilege, right? And that undermines the legitimacy of the Jewish people, and, and, and sorry, some progressive elements in the conversation or the discourse of uh, identity politics undermine the Jewish people right to identify as a collective. So the ability of the Jewish community to change the discourse, to effectively engage with the anti-racist groups is critical for this, for this challenge. So this is, this is, this is, I believe, the main, uh, a very important uh, global trend or American trend, which will affect our conversation. If I, if I may, I just want to add uh, and go back and build on something that Iran said earlier, and that is the absolute crucial significance of the space and field and professionals of community relations. Um, I want to I wanna actually take a step back and say that when we as Reut came into this field, we had no preconceived notions. We were doing 
uh, strategic analysis and strategic work. And we were trying to understand the nature of the emerging challenges for American Jewry and for Israel. And that's how we sort of landed on the conclusion that the long-term well-being and security of American Jewry depends on the quality of its community relations. And what's so interesting about this challenge of community relations is that it is really a democratized and decentralized challenge. Okay, yes, there is a top-down element, JCPA is important and so on. But perhaps even more important is the work that is done locally with locally elected and appointed officials, with uh, uh, other religious groups, with associations and so on. So uh, the collaboration that you guys are talking about is, is, is a collaboration that is built on nurturing long-standing relationships. I, wa I wanna just say that um, when we have looked at cases of success in dealing with the uh, assaults on Israel legitimacy and BDS mo uh, motions, including in Orange County, always the key to success was that in the right moment, a relationship that had been nurtured for a long period of time was deployed, okay? This means that someone like you, you, Jeff, or Lisa, or other people on this call, someone could pick up the phone, go to a meeting in a restaurant, and have an honest conversation with someone else that they knew that made a difference. Right. This is the single common denominator among all success, uh, successes that we have seen. Sure. And nurturing these relationships is a long-term effort. You, it has to be authentic. It happens over time. Uh, it can't be sort of a, a um, it, obviously it can be political and situational, but it, to really have value, it's the long term, and so, that's why it's a. So this 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 uh, this corresponds to several questions we have coming through, but so so it's true that that these development of relationships in the communities we live and thrive and how we extend those relationships again seems to be the key when we actually have success. However, we're living in this world now of um, social media um, and mainstream media, which, which are, couldn't really be more oppositional in the way that they communicate or, or send messaging. And of course, um, just to be really candid, you guys are being very candid, but one of the things I always watch is when people say engage the community, engage people. I have to tell you as a business leader, it doesn't mean a lot to me um, because usually engagement today corresponds to some sort of outreach or touch or communication, which may not be meaningful at all. How do you think about the adaptability of what can be done in our localized communities with key decision makers and adapt that within the framework of a very polarized mainstream media and a very, let's call it free ranging, chaotic, non-factual social media. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, if you can solve that, you can be president. I think for the I next four years, the job is taken. And I'm, 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 and I would be actually, if anybody lays the birther um, ac accusation about me, they would be right. Born in Israel. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Okay. So, so uh, with your permission, I'll try to reframe your question because it's a. I, what, what is the real concern here, and, and and what is the question? And and I want maybe to give an example from uh, from the UK when the Labour Party in Britain elected as chair uh, Jeremy Corbyn who is, by the way, a clear anti-Semite. It's not a, it's a, there the, are the very doubts about this. We spoke about the threat of Corbynization. What is Corbynization? Lowering the cultural norms that used to protect the Jewish community from anti-Semitism. And indeed we saw that uh, the Corbyn effect exceeds the frontiers of the UK. So the question is, what are the current prospects of lowering the cultural norms that are protecting the Jewish community in the US? And um, 
And I believe that, uh, you know, the, the threats now are obvious. The people who are affiliated with the progressive wind uh, uh, often take a very, who often take a very critical view of Israel must be feeling very energized uh, uh, in the current uh, circumstances. And, and many of them, you know, have, have kept a low profile prior to the elections. And we expect now the conversation about Israel to be uh, maybe even more polarizing. But there's also an opportunity to heal the discourse regarding Israel. If the Jewish community will be able to maintain and work and to work with officials to maintain the bipartisan status, then I believe that we, we could really change. Uh, it, it's going to be a game, uh, game changer. If the Democratic Party centrists will take a clear position against the current toxic progressive discourse on Israel and the Jewish establishment, I hope and believe that they could potentially be the most effective voices against them. This is due to their seemingly proximity to the pretension of progressive to serve liberal agenda. When a democratic administration denounces extreme progressive discourse, it is more effective than when a Republican administration does. So I really believe that there's an opportunity here. And, and as I said, uh, what's important for Jewish leadership is to strive to maintain the bipartisan status of Israel. And the Israeli government, by the way, should work to recover the relationship with the Democratic Party. And we have a couple gingerly worded questions, but I'll just, so, so, so listen, it's, it's tough to open your mouth today and not get criticized as being something um, uh, racist, uh, indifferent, um, whatever. But we have a couple questions related to how, how might you think about wading into discussions uh, with the uh, African American community and other communities of color how might you think about having discussions about um, the imagery and actions that are going on in the Orthodox community related to COVID? Th these are touchy things. How, how, what advice do you have? I, I would like to suggest, uh, I'll touch the uh, engagement with, uh, with Black movements, with Afro-American movements. We make a distinction between two types of uh, organizations. One are ideological anti-Zionist or anti-Semites, uh, not anti-Semites, let's talk about, about Israel, ideological anti-Zionist organizations uh, who work in the progressive field in order to, uh, to undermine Israel and to undermine uh, Jewish community organizations. We believe that these elements are very few in number and are very weak politically. There's another element here of, we call them solidar intersectional solidarity supporters. So these are groups and individuals who may support anti-Israeli agenda, but they do it out of solidarity, not out of ideology. We believe that by and large, black movements belong to the latter. Namely, even if they find themselves in an anti-Israeli uh, theater, it's usually, be, it's usually not anchored in anti-Zionist ideology. So we believe that there's a, the prospects of engagement with the black movements is actually uh, exist, especially when uh, Black Lives Matter, for example, is a very decentralized movement. So it's not a hierarchical organization. And, 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 uh, and due to the current uh, anti-racist struggle, which focuses on black exceptionalism on the expense of intersectionality, we believe that the prospects of engagement are higher. And from what we hear from the field, from Jewish community relations uh, organizations, um, uh, they, they, what we understand is the prospects of engagement are far uh, more successful uh, during uh, this period if we compare it to the following, uh, following Ferguson. Jeff, uh, um, if I may, I want to say that uh... The, the big crisis in American society today um, that we see in, um, in different communities, I'm talking about the economic crisis, the economic dislocation, is also in some ways a major opportunity for the Jewish community because the Jewish community is really connected to the local challenges and also connected 
to the solutions. The solutions exist around the Jewish world and in Israel. So I know that right now, sort of the Jewish community in America is in, in uh, sort of a, a bunker, in the bunker, in defense mode, and a lot of the institutions are thinking about survival. But there is a huge opportunity here for American Jewry to play a dramatic leadership role in the recovery of America. When I say dramatic, I'm so relative to size, right? The fact that there's uh, our Jews here are less than 2% of the population. So I'm not talking about, but I'm talking relative to size, a qualitatively extremely significant contribution to the recovery of American society. And there is, that, that option is there. Perhaps we don't have the time to expand on it. It's, you know. The second thing I want to relate, if I may, is to the ultra-Orthodox community. I want to say that someone that on the one hand was extremely critical of their response to COVID. But I also want to say that someone that wrote flexibility. Okay? So here's what happened from the perspective of flexibility. Bird's eye view, 30,000 feet. And that is that one fraction of our community took a different route. They did not follow orders. There was mass disobedience in some parts of this community, at least in Israel. And guess what? Now they're very, very close to herd immunity. The spread of COVID in their community is actually decreasing. So what I want to say is that from the perspective from my perspective, I was very upset, but from the perspective of flexibility, maybe the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel taught us a very important lesson about dealing with COVID. And that is that ultimately, if the entire community goes all out, protects its education institutions, keeps them going, the schools and so on, accept the risks of mass contraction of, uh, of COVID, Ultimately, they're coming out on the other side, I think, successful, the Haredi community in Israel. So I know it's a very sort of a counterintuitive view, but from the perspective of flexibility, it's beautiful because it just shows about the interaction among different factions in our community when we come to deal with challenges. And there was another group out there that took a different route. They accepted the responsibility. They were willing to pay the price. And right now, it's an, like an astonishing unfolding uh, experiment right in front of our eyes. And by the way, I think the, you know, the jury is still out on whether they failed or they succeeded. It may be that they actually succeeded far beyond anybody would have uh, anticipated in terms of the balancing between dealing with COVID and protecting their institution and keeping their lives going and so on. Thank you, Giddy. Listen. I hope everyone um, who's attended today, uh, still with us, uh, understands how much we appreciate the candor and uh, I would say outright bravery of our ability to have dialogue on difficult uh, issues uh, with the Rayut uh, Institute uh, principles and and uh, the thoughtful responses usually, uh, and I, I would say always based on research um, that we get from them. And, um, you know, we just, we just try to keep learning. We keep trying to adapt because what uh, what worked in Orange County in 20, uh, 2008, 9, and 10, that was a smashing success to reverse the uh, horrible things going on, may not work today. <laughs> and, and we have to always be on our feet. With that, let me turn it. Uh, first, let me, uh, I, I didn't acknowledge my co-chair, Dr. Jim Weiss of the Rose Council. And let me turn it back over to Lisa Armoni, our director. and. Uh, I think a national treasure uh, for progressing these issues in the United States. Lisa. I just, I want to thank everybody for, for their participation today. I want to thank Iran, Giddy, and Jeff for the really um, thought provoking conversation. Um, thank everybody for their questions, which I mean clearly indicated that this is, these are subjects that are on the minds of Jewish communal leaders and that we are uh, looking forward to continuing these conversations as we navigate these very interesting times. Um, we will be sending out a recording um, as well as a, a model grid of the matrix. I know a number of people have asked for that. And we invite you to continue to uh, journey with us as we, um, as we explore these spaces together and find ways to, um, to support our Jewish communal institutions and our Jewish community globally. 
So with that, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.